you, Laura. It's a great pleasure to give a talk at KITP. You know, I have spent a lot of time here. And Doug Scalapino is here. Otherwise, I would have said that I have been connected to this place longer than anybody in the audience and anybody in this building, because I first came here in 1992 for three months. But you are sitting here, so I cannot say that. <laughs> he, you know, he is the person who made this place possible with his friends, the four heroes. Uh, it's an amazing place. So what I want to talk about is, you know, strange metal and, and, and plunky, and, but I'm going to use, you know, I'm the, I think the last Fermi liquid theorist uh, who, is, who is fighting on, and I'm going to use a purely Fermi liquid quasi-particle picture to see to what extent we can understand strange metallicity and Planckian, okay? And I'll make the point, uh, Erez made it with very concrete example that strange metal is not necessarily equal to non-Fermi liquid, and in fact, many, I would make a stronger statement, many strange metallic behavior actually arises from Fermi liquid physics. And the other thing, there is a, there is a feeling, at least among some people, that if you see strong temperature dependence in some property, that means it's a non-Fermi liquid. That is a bias based entirely on metal physics, where Fermi temperature is 50,000 Kelvin, and then temperature dependence doesn't come from electronic properties. But many of the so-called strongly correlated materials, which are two-dimensional, often have low Fermi temperatures. So you actually have to do a calculation uh, because the temperature dependence may be coming from mundane effects, and you actually have to do the hard work. So this is going to be my conclusion also. So strangeness is approximate, my, the definition of strangeness I'm using is approximate t-linear resistivity over a large range. Large depends on parameters, so it's, it's not unique. What large is is not, large is not in the 100 Kelvin. 10 Kelvin may be large in some situations. It depends on the context. Uh, Planckian behavior is an appropriately extracted transport scattering time. That requires knowing other parameters. That's another problem. You know, you can measure resistivity, but to know one over tau, you have it, you have to use some theoretical bias. Uh, both are kind of reported, I think kind of, because when you look at the data very carefully, very few of them are strictly linear, okay? Uh, and, and so that's what I mean by kind of. They're reported experimentally in various contexts in many materials. So the phenomenon certainly exists, uh, but I would argue that there is a single generic universal mechanism underlying all strangeness and Planckian behavior. System-dependent physics is in play here in different materials under different such situations. And you have already seen this in other talks. For example, Georg Schmalian told us there's a very specific model. He can connect it, Subit told us, connected with uh, this random UCO coupling or some two-level system. You get strangeness out of it. You solve the problem. I'll tell you totally different mechanisms or also you get those things. And I would have everything I'm talking about, there's no quantum criticality. Nothing is put in by hand. Everything I'll show you is actual calculations within approximation schemes. And people of goodwill could disagree how applicable my approximations are to specific experimental situations. All I can tell you is that they're very substantial calculations. And for those systems, no one here will be able to do better because these are very hard calculations. Okay. All right. So this is the most strange behavior I know, and most Planckian behavior I know. This is resistivity of metals. This I added because I saw confusion even in this conference. This is resistivity of metals, scale to resistivity at, let's say, Debye temperature for different metals, plotted as a function of T over theta. It scales. It's purely linear. And look, linearity goes down to one-fifth of the Debye temperature. The, it, is, it is true what Ashcroft and Marvin say, that T is much, much larger than theta Debye, it's linear, but the reverse is not true. T is actually, the resistivity is already linear at one-fifth the Debye temperature, and if you show Bolt, see Boltzmann theory, that's what you find for all materials. And so this you have to keep in mind, and this is, you know, this is actually linear for this theta Debye over five in metals, and then if you extract an H bar over tau, I'm going to show you, it's linear over a very large range, from 50 Kelvin, typically 40 to 50 Kelvin for almost all metals, to 1,000 Kelvin until it melts. Uh, maybe maybe 800. Now, of course, it remains linear for T much, much larger than theta Debye also. So I was wrong. Ashcraft and Marmin is not wrong, but it starts at much lower temperature. Now, the important thing for my purpose is that theta Debye is just an accidental cutoff. Theta Debye is the maximum possible energy of phonons in the Brillouin zone, and that is only because Fermi momentum is huge in metals. If you actually do the Boltzmann transport theory, solve the integral equation, you know, there is no real cutoff, 
what you find is Theravada Bai is actually replaced by what is called block Grunaizan temperature, which is nothing other than the energy of a phonon with two kf wave vector. And the reason is very simple. That's the maximal resistivity, right? Electron going this way comes back this way, so that's two kf scattering. The phonon associated with that is really the cutoff temperature. In metals, theta dB is always larger than, always smaller than this block Grunaizan temperature. So the metal, the cutoff becomes theta dB. But in all the materials, these low density materials that people are talking about, you know, the strangeness, T block Grunaizan is the correct temperature. And again, it's divided by five or six. Okay, so all the materials I'll be talking about in the talk, this is the cutoff. And you can extract a, uh, a H bar over tau from this because in metals the numbers are known, uh, effective density, effective mass, and then this is a very well-known formula among old many-body theorists. You can write the H bar over tau here as 2 pi lambda kBT, this linear part. This lambda is the so-called transport electron phonon coupling constant. It's around 0.1 for copper. That's why copper doesn't go superconducting, around 1.5 for lead, and you can see that this Planckian is basically always obeyed or strongly violated in metals. It's one to seven. And again, uh, Professor Scalapina contributed mightily to this 60s. I learned a lot from his article in Park's famous book. I say that this lambda transport is roughly equal to within 10% with lambda superconductivity that goes into, you know, Bardin, Cooper, Schiffer, Elias bacteria superconductivity. So, and I have been told even in some uh, electron drop cupids, Rick Green told me, this kind of holes. Of course, it doesn't have to come from phonons. This, this equality has nothing to do with phonons. You just need some kind of boson. So, yeah. What was that? Right. You're constantly saying you disagree with things a lot of us have said. And it's really a question of terminology. You know, nobody's claimed this is black yet. Uh, this is just an introduction. This is not, you know, this is old stuff. So then why are you making such statements? Because there were talks here saying that linearity only applies to T much, much larger than theta D. This I, but this. But the claims of Lockheed, it's a very different regime. No, but let, let me go to my talk. This is known stuff. I'm just, okay. just introduction, trust me. But you and I don't disagree here, right? There's nothing you disagree here with, right? Nothing you disagree. Okay, good. So let's, let's go to the next thing. Okay, good. So we all agree on this. So now I'm going to talk about uh, just Planckian. Let me just talk about Planckian. This is a recent paper. And uh, this is just only thing out about Planckian arising from inelastic scattering, okay? So this is an electron liquid, just jelly and background. And we can calculate the imaginary part of the self-energy. This is an old electron gas problem with an RP exactly. This is Coulomb interaction. And this is a well-defined theory, this is an expansion in fine structure constant RS, and so it's exact as RS is very small, what is very small you do not know, and then when RS is larger, it systematically deviates from, from exact result, but the exact result can be calculated, and you can calculate this imaginary part of the self-energy uh, analytically up to third order, you actually need up to fourth order also, it's not very meaningful to go beyond second order. Second order is a very famous result, T square log T, because it's two dimension, this was done a long time ago. We added some terms, but this can be actually numerically calculated uh, without much problem. You have to do a three dimensional integral. So this is the result of that calculation. This is imaginary part of self energy, you know, on, for the quasi particle. I'm calling this gamma of T, which is kind of a standard notation in semiconductor physics, divided by Fermi energy for different values of RS. Remember for RS is equal to six, the theory probably is not very valid. And for RS is equal to one, it's like, you know, somewhere, the theory is increasingly less accurate as RS increases. This is, these are the results that come out if you just use the analytic formula, which is valid very close to T is equal to zero. This is the full integral done. And the point I want to make is twofold. One is that it always remains way below Fermi energy. And, you know, you can look at our paper, we did not find a manifest failure of quasi-particle approximation at any temperature. If you actually do the calculation, the imaginary part of self-energy for the quasi-particle is always less than Fermi energy up to very large energy. But more interesting is that we can write gamma as to the part P, just an empirical fit, and then ask what this P is. And this P, of course, has to be two or close to two. There is a log correction. When T is very, very small, this is the famous T square, 
But then when t is deviates from being very small, and look, this is telling them by minus four on this scale, and these are for different, de different values of Rs. A p could be anything. So when somebody's doing an experiment and plotting this exponent p, and very similar things happen for energy also, which I'm not talking about because I gave a seminar where I talked about it. So when people talk about this p being different from two, being very small one, one has to ask, what is the Fermi temperature? Now, if you know the Fermi temperature is very high, and you are getting p deviating from two already here, that's very significant, okay? But if you do not know what your density is, and p is deviating from one over here, okay, over here, 100, that's kind of expected, okay? So the so point I'm making is that this is a calculation now you know how to do, electron gas in a jelly and Coulomb interaction, and p goes all the way from two to something small, and eventually becomes even smaller, and it's just what it should be. Now the important result, I'm showing you gamma t, this imaginary part of self-energy, the broadening on, on, on the shell or the quasi-particle, divided by kBt. To my surprise, I expected this number to be anything, okay? Because I thought the Planckian hypothesis would not hold, but you can see it's never more than four. So, so empirically what you're finding is that for this well-defined problem, this is a very well-defined problem, textbook problem, Planckian holds within a factor of four. So if you generalize the Planckian and say that h bar over tau is not, you know, it's not kBT, but of the order of kBT, in this case four kBT, we found that it's always obeyed. Trust me, I tried very hard to disobey Planckian, but I failed. And this is, of course, the correct thing to compare because of the inelastic scattering rate, okay? Uh, well, Eisenstein did an experiment a long time ago in, the, in, in, in 1997, tunneling experiment gallium arsenide, and uh, you know this, this theory agrees with that, but that's not the point. Point is that you can extract this gamma t over kBT from Eisenstein's experiment also, and experimentally also, the, the, you know, to the extent he went, it's, it's below a factor of four. Okay, so this is an interesting uh, empirical finding. I don't have a theory here, my theory is on gamma, and then when I plot gamma over kBT, I find it's less than four, that's a fact. Electron gas model, the standard electron gas model in a jellium. No, this is just inelastic scattering rate. This, there is no momentum here. Yeah. yeah, this is imaginary part of the self energy. This is this quantity. No, I'm not comparing transport. I'm just saying everything is inelastic scattering here. I'm talking about this is not transport, okay? As I said, my first slide is not on transport. It's a standalone slide on inelastic scattering, okay? Because if you look at the Planckian literature, it's claimed that one should really compare to inelastic scattering. This is energy relaxation. There is no transport here at all. It's a perfect conductor. You're right, okay? So, you know, this slide is standalone. It's just inelastic scattering, just electron-electron scattering, okay, nothing else. Uh, so Planckian is obeyed by the electron-electron inelastic scattering rate within 40. So what are some of the ordinary mechanisms? This is the one I to told you about that everybody knows that should be correctly pointed out. But I'm going to talk about another mechanism which is very known to some people here, but it doesn't look like it's very well known. So item one is generic. This is what Subir was emphasizing, phonon high T result, which could extend to very low electronic temperature for small kf. Item two is a totally different mechanism, and I want to discuss that in the, in the next few slides, okay? So uh, this mechanism, let me first show you experimental data, okay? This is old experimental data from, I think this one is from uh, Mike Lilly and Jim Eisenstein, two-dimensional silicon MOSFET. This is temperature. This is resistivity, and these are all for different densities. At some point, there is an effective <laughs> low density metal insular transition, effective transitions across over actually. But let's look at the metallic place. And you know, this is very strong temperature dependence going down to 50 millikelvin, best temperature. If, if you saw in a strongly corrigated material, you'd be correct thinking something very non fermi liquid is going on. Why is this material showing such strong temperature dependence at such low temperature? Eventually it saturates, you know. But you can see temperature is very strong and it's approximately linear. This is our theoretical calculation. I'll explain the theory to you in a second, which kind of agrees with it. This is joint paper with that, that, that group, the Sandia group. And, and this is like what's going on at very low temperature. Resistivity changes by a lot. It could change by a factor of two or three over a few Kelvin change in temperature. Extremely anomalous behavior, okay? What is it coming from? This is another one done in collaboration with Mike Manfra at, at Purdue. This is 2D holes in gallium arsenide. Again, this is experiment, resistivity 
changes a lot over the, this is medical thing, okay? And this is our theory, again, there is approximate agreement. And so the point I want to make, these are gate X systems so that you can change carrier density. So you are changing Fermi energy and temperature, both. So in 2D gate X systems, MOSFETs, both N and T can be varied widely, leading to a, T is not exactly equal to TF, but you can easily go to T over TF of the order of 10 or even five, uh, because you can change N. You can make any very small. Now that the disorder in all these semiconductor, good thing is any semiconductor system, so you know what kind of disorder we have. These are the best materials one has among all electronic materials. You know, mean free path of this system at high density is microns, okay? <laughs> so the disorder is almost invariably random charged impurities in the environment. That is true for your CMOS that you have in your computer also, because even in this clinical environment, what they grow these materials, apparently people still sweat and sodium ions get in there, okay? So this is mostly sodium ions, points. And so what basically happens is that because you have a lot of carriers, the carriers screen the Coulomb disorder, and what you are seeing is the temporal dependence of this effective screen disorder. So, you know, in, in metals, you don't think of screening as temperature dependent, but in these 2D systems, it happens, and it arises from these Friedel oscillations in, in the system, so um, let me just explain to you where it's coming from. So the theory is a solution of boltzmann kubo theory using screen Coulomb disorder. So in 2D, the Lindhardt function, the 2D polarizability at zero temperature has a cusp. You know, 1D just, you have just this uh, derivative uh, is singular, but here you have a cusp. And what happens if you calculate it, this is just a numerical calculation. Over here, when temperature wave vector is very small, the dependence on temperature is exponentially small. This is an intuitive feeling that in a correction, temperature will be exponential, but because of this cusp, and what is this cusp exactly at 2KF? What is happening here is irrelevant for transport. Only thing that matters is what is happening here, and it's strongly suppressed. This suppression is actually square root of T. And this is very well known. By the way, all this temperature dependence will be cut off at dingle temperature, I'm not gonna talk about it. So if the dingle temperature is high, you're not gonna see this behavior at all. And uh, so we are in what is called the ballistic transport, what h bar over tau is less than kBT. So this is how two-dimensional, yeah. This is only elastic scattering, okay? Only elastic scattering, yeah. So this is how it behaves. I have separated the dependence on temperature at 2K, see how strongly it depends on temperature. This is square root of T, okay? But if you did it at Q is equal to zero, which is the standard Thomas Fermi screening theory, you are gonna completely miss it because it's not gonna give you any temperature dependence on low temperature exponential. What happens in 3D that you are all familiar with? 3D, I just, you know, I just gave, I'm giving you the comparison. Here, nothing very special is happening in 2D. It's, it's you know, it's weak in 2D, Q is equal to zero and Q is equal to 2K are not very different. Now again, to the experts, it's very well done because you can actually calculate analytically the dependence of the polarizability around 2KF and you find the square root of T. This has a name, and the Chubukhar has worked a lot on it, Mera has worked on it, and the Mel SI, many people have worked a lot on it. This is called non-analytic behavior in 2D. Non-analytic meaning over here, the dependence is square root of T. It's unexpected, it's not exponential, and in 3D, on the other hand, it's T squared, it's Sommerfeld. Here it's not Sommerfeld, okay? And then, if you, once you take that into account, you can calculate resistivity analytically in leading order, and then you immediately find that the register, this is an analytic result, resistivity must go linear in T, the correction, not T square. Sommerfeld expansion will give you T square, but because of the square root, this is T. So, resistivity, temperature correction resistivity is anomalously enhanced. You get an automatic strange metal behavior here as linear in T coming from screen disorder or coming from this polarizability effect. And uh, you can calculate it to up to, we calculate up to fourth order in, in analytically. And this is a well-known thing, trying to understand 2D transport goes back more than 25 years. And, you know, we wrote a first paper taking this approach. Then uh, Zala, Alena, and Narizny wrote a paper showing that this is basically the ballistic part of um, uh, Arshula runoff effect. But there are some issues there, because if you take that approach, then you are adding both heart tree and exchange, then the resistivity could decrease also as a function of temperature. This is the old issue of RPA versus including some vortex correction. I have nothing fruitful to say about that. We are doing pure RPA. And Sommerfeld expansion fails, you get a linear in T. This has been verified in hundreds of experiments. And let me show you a very recent one. 
because I think York talked about the temperature dependence of TMD, so I added that. So he actually showed the experiment from Columbia and said that, look, it's, you know, the standard argument, look, it's strongly temperature dependent resistivity at low temperature, so it must be something strange and, 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 and odd, you have to remember, and this is this effect I claim, and I wrote, we wrote a paper showing that, with two papers actually, one showing the temperature dependence agrees with the experiment. I'm not going to go into the details, but trust me, it agrees with the experiment to the level of accuracy experimental parameters are known. Okay, so we did, you know, factor of 50%. So this is low temperature, Columbia, Cornell, electrons, holes, they have everything, because TMD can tune, you can go on the whole side, electron side, and the experimentally soon, we agree that this is a possible explanation. This may not be the explanation, this is a possible explanation. Agreement is quite good. So this is very recent work, the papers came out as nature papers, two nature papers back to back. Okay, so in... For me, sir, exactly. And if you didn't have a perfectly circular Fermi surface, what would be different? Uh, the, the effect will still be there, but it's not quantitative. Because the fact that the cusp exists is still there, okay? And you have to do, we have not, we have done it for small ellipticity, analytically, and it survives. I cannot tell you what would happen if it's totally different. It's a very good question, actually. Maybe you and I should talk about it, okay? Uh, because I always worked on systems on the circular Fermi surface approximation is pretty, pretty good, okay? Um, or at least effective mass approximation, very good. Two effective mass explains it. Two effective mass, it works, I can tell you, okay? So, so this is, you know, this is again, a very recent, I think the two papers came out in Nature last year, maybe even this year, and I work very closely with those experimentalists, okay? So the basic point is that we can actually, since I have an analytic theory, we can actually then ask, does it obey Planckian, since we have analytic theory? I'm not gonna go into the details, you should read the paper. Just by combining Euphoria Regal Mott criterion, meaning resistivity cannot be larger than the limit imposed by KFL is equal to one, and energy time Heisenberg uncertainty relation, we actually put a limit on H bar over tau transport just within this model. I do not want to emphasize, I want to emphasize, I don't want to take more credit than is due. Just using this formula, we get again this inequality there, this 4KBD. This is for transport now within this model. I do not know what would happen in other models, okay? And um, uh, and and this is, again, there, there are a lot of stuff here. What we are showing in this paper is that when you extract gamma, tau for transport, this is this resistivity I'm talking about, extract a tau and convert that into Gauti over Kemet, we could not find, I was very disappointed by this. I was sure this number will be anything, 100, 500, it never exceeds four. We looked at many, many systems. The postdoc did an enormous amount of work. And then we extracted every single experiment we could find. It was really a lot of work. All the experiments digitized them fine. No experiment, the number goes above two. So empirically, this is an experiment. Empirically, gamma over T is less than four. Theoretically, also it's less than four. I cannot tell you why, except for this very simple dimensional argument combined energy, time, uncertainty with Eofer-Egel Mott criterion, and you just, this result just comes out in our paper, that the, the, the limit is 4KBT, uh, how, and, and combined with this formula, of course. Is, this is not very general, but uh, it's a surprise, okay? So uh, um, let me just take one minute to just tell the phonon thing, because should we ask this? So let me quickly go to the phonon result, and I'm, I'm really going to go. So phonon, this is for graphene, uh, the thing is, this is, what we all know that is linear in T for large temperature. And we did this for graphene. And here is our theory. Here is Philip King's experiment. Here an experiment agree extremely well. He sees the linear in temperature behavior at high temperature, then Bogoloba block Grunizan behavior at T to the power four. Lower theory came long before experiment. And everything agrees quantitatively, you know, where it changes, everything, okay? But then came twisted bilayer graphene, and Andrea Young called me saying, everything looks like what we have in this paper, but the actual resistivity from ohm has gone to kilo ohm, factor of 1,000 more in twisted bilayer graphene. So he at first fit it, and then he said, oh, the difference is a factor of 1,000. And the reason is very simple, at least within this model, there is a one over velocity because of Dirac electrons in the definition of lambda. And of course, when you have twisted bilayer graphene, the flat band, and actually the velocity is going to zero. And again, time has run out. We have done a lot of work, including this physics, including full band structure and the full 
uh, uh, full Vanoff singularity. Uh, you know, you should look at this paper, and there is very recent work from Rafal's group showing that phonons are affected. The, I'm just going to end, because this is really another talk, that once you include all of these things, it looks like much of twisted bilayer graphene, oh, sorry, much of twisted bilayer graphene uh, transport not all, but much, you can ask me what part we cannot explain, is explained by this electron phonon interaction being enhanced in a Dirac system because of flat band. Okay, and then, you know, we compare with experiment and we do full, full calculation using the actual band structure, okay? We can explain things down to one Kelvin, but maybe not to 100 millikelvin. So let me end with this slide. I was so perplexed by, my goal was to destroy Planckian. I mean, Sean Hartnell knows this very well. I started this project as saying that there is no Planckian, I'll do calculations. And then I was completely flabbergasted, everything I do, Planckian limit seems to be empirically satisfied, okay? So then I looked at all the semiconductors, you know, in the end I'm a semiconductor physicist, just from the literature. Every, so it's a bit like the figure Andy McKenzie had his famous paper. This is extended to all semiconductors, you know, graphene here, twisted graphene there, silicon, germanium, gallium arsenide, and indium antimonide, N germanium, P germanium. Man, it's just always obeyed, Planckian. What? Transport, all transport. So we really went to the database. It's in, there is an uh, UFA Institute in St. Petersburg gives you many of these numbers. We took those numbers, N and M were very accurately known, semiconductor, you know, and I converted all of that, and it's always obeyed. Some of them are very high temperature transport. You know, you can see, Look at the temperatures here, okay? And this is dominated by optical phonon. Nothing in disorder, electron electron interaction. See, this is just an empirical fact. I mean, I, I, I cannot assign any meaning to it. And I have to say that I find it both very perplexing and, and uh, you know, is it a coincidence? Maybe it's not a coincidence. Maybe, you know, maybe that's the only scale, temperature. So I'm going to end with this purely empirical finding that, uh, that generalized Planckian seems to apply very generically. You know, many of these, you have to understand, many of these materials are temper, it's not linear. So we are just taking at the high temperature, I gave you the temperature and converting it. There is, you know, when it's optical phonon, the resistivity is kind of exponential, but still it seems to be approximately obeyed. And this place is a good place to stop. I have something on William and Franz Law, but obviously I cannot go there now because time has run out. You can ask me about Widem and Franz Law. It's me, not Chandra. Oh. <laughs> can we go back to your standalone uh, slide on Absolutely. the self-energy uh, calculation? I should be able to go back. Uh, hold on. One of the first few. Yeah, I know. The very first, uh, second, second slide, uh, very first substantive slide. You know better. That's why I put it right in the beginning because that has nothing to do with the rest of the talk. The one coming now. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So uh, if you look at the argument of the log, it is Rs times Tf in the formula of yeah. Yeah. And actually that's for a good reason, because this is plasma frequency. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Mm -hmm. In two dimensions, that's is yeah, 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 frequency absolutely. estimated mm -hmm. yeah. at the momentum which mm -hmm. is equal to mm -hmm. cup, right? Mm -hmm. So, but the temperature is much larger, so suppose that our R sub S is very small. Then, plasma frequency is much smaller than other Fermi energy. And in this interval, one over tau is linear because electrons scatter uh, elastically on their own plasmas. Do you see it in your calculations? Uh, the, the, linear uh, uh, trust me, we made our theory agree, not only the leading order, I'm very f proud of this third order result. I mean, Andre knows the history for it. We made our theory, we measure numerical results, agree with the analytical results precisely, okay? So what you're saying is include, included in there. I, we don't divide it in all these things that you're asking about. Linear. What, linear in what? This is the formula. Are you disagreeing with them? Maybe I'm not understanding the question. What I'm saying is that for temperature is much larger than at the plasma frequency, but much oh, smaller oh, oh. than the Fermi. Oh, no. should be T linear. much, much larger than TF, it definitely no, 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 is linear. No. Much no. smaller than TF, much larger than at the plasma frequency. Okay, that particular region. First, I do not think this formula applies there. It because doesn't. Yeah. If you go there, yeah. you would see that. I, I did not that check that. I did not check that. I could check it, but I'm sure it will agree because I totally believe this result is correct, okay? So I have no doubt about it, but I'll check specifically and give you the answer, okay? 
I think it's the same calculation, but maybe two slides later on. I didn't quite understand what you were seeing, saying about No, two slides uh, on would not be the same calculation. This is, again, I don't want to confuse you. I have shown a lot of. This is the only electron electron interaction calculation. In, this is not transport. Okay. This is just this imaginary part of the cell frame. This is yeah, just this diagram. I thought it was the on okay. paper. But at any rate, it sounded to me like what you were saying was that Yofei Regal was some input into the calculation. Uh, and, which one is the input? Uh, Yofei Regal. Some input to the no, that was no, that was, no, that was right. okay. I, I confused you. Yeah. So what I'm saying, we have a full theory where Euphoregal doesn't come in at all. Okay. All the results I'm showing you, literally, are a microscopic calculation, a bunch of random charge impurities, a bunch of electrons, and we just solve the Boltzmann theory transport, really numerically, solve the integral equation, including screening of the charge impurities. Okay. So that's all the results I'm showing you. Then I'm saying, okay. I do have an analytical result. As a theorist, of course, I like analytical results. Analytical results do not describe any of the results I'm showing you. They are fully numerical. Okay? These results are all fully numerical. You can see the deviation. That's the analytical results. Okay? Now I'm saying, based on the analytical results that we have, can we understand the Planckian behavior just based on the analytical results? Okay? And the answer is yes, we can if we combine your federal criterion with energy time uncertainty. Okay? You have to look at the paper because your federal just tells you a statement on KFL. It's not a statement on tau. So you have to do a little bit more. It's really a dimensional argument. I'm not the first one to make it. Sean has made a similar argument also. And it's even implied in Zanin's work. And all I'm saying is that it's a very simple thing. Okay. Trust me. Okay. I can show it to you afterwards. So there, then we get a tau minimum. Okay. It's, uh, that's the only place we use your federal. That's to show what is the minimum possible value of tau and it does that obey and we found that it obeys within a factor of four. So your federal doesn't come in anywhere except at the end when you find that Planckian is always obeyed. It's an empirical numerical finding. As a theorist, I'm not completely happy with it. And I tried to see, can I derive it some way? And there is a simple way of deriving it. That's all I'm telling you. Okay, and this derivation is not, not something I will write a paper on. This is just, you know, five lines in a 30 page paper, okay? You're just saying you're using, uh, you're going from your resistivity to a, exactly. to a rate. Exactly, using, exactly. So, yeah. Okay. yeah, that's all I'm saying, yeah. That's exactly what you do. That's why I said that I don't even want to talk about it, okay? Yeah, Shankar, I want to ask you a question about, so you showed data for 2D electron and 2D hole systems. Yes, uh, yes, I did. So uh, in this uh, systems, in appropriate densities, RS is not small. So it could oh, be 10, absolutely. 25. Oh, no, RS is not so small on. at all. So I would like to ask you a question about the status of RPA in the regime when RS is not yeah. small. Yeah. And so yeah. what, uh, so yeah, this is how, a, how does it work? Yeah, this because is. Because all of the polarization functions that you calculated are yeah. bare electrons. Yeah. So what is Very the good question. Of? Very good question. And um, uh, the answer can be given in many levels. Uh, one is that we do what we can. Nobody can do anything better. So uh, applying RPA for RS larger than one is, of course, uh, a very old practice. CD metals have RS equal to five and six. And it has been used routinely in the 60s and 70s. And, and it quote unquote works, whatever that means, meaning experiment and theory are not very far. That's the empirical argument. I can tell you my view on it. My view is that I'm actually a calculator. Okay, I'm, I'm not a theorist, I'm a calculator, okay? So I will do the calculations, and if there is no quantum phase transition intervening at some specific RS, then what I expect is as RS goes down, the theory will become progressively less and less accurate, okay? Progressively. But there is no reason for it to fail somewhere because RS less than one is an arbitrary number. We do not know what the expansion parameter is. Maybe the expansion parameter is 55 RS or, you know, or pi to the power four RS. Or maybe the expansion parameter is RS divided by one plus RS because to know what the expansion parameter is, I have to do the calculation with the vertex corrections in the, and any attempt at that, including my own attempt, gives you complete garbage. It's well known that you try to improve RF, RPA in a systematic perturbation theory. You do not get anything meaningful. And so deep somewhere, and this has been alluded to in this discussion, certainly Andre and I talk about it a lot, the actual expansion parameter is something else, okay? And it may very well be that that's becoming a constant, and we argue that using static screening, but these are all loose arguments. If you are not going to believe it, there's nothing I can tell you that will make you a believer. I'm just telling you all the arguments that I, but my main argument is that I do the calculation, I tell you the truth, what I have done, it's a microscopic calculation, and then I compare it experiment, and I find it progressively fails as RS increases, 
but there is no value of RS where it just totally fails. Okay, so this is the empirical argument, but you're absolutely correct that, but I will again emphasize, I do not know what the expansion parameter is. It doesn't have to be RS. It could be, you know, only once I made an attempt to do the next order calculation, graphene, we did alpha, we went all the way with full loop. We learned from this famous QED person who just passed away recently in Japan, how to do those integrals. The moment we go to higher loop, we find strong coupling fixed points, which are completely unphysical, which are artifacts of going to higher loop. Because if you're expanding in a large number, you don't want to go to many orders. So I do not think that part arbitration theory is going to answer your question. You need to find the, solve the problem in a strong coupling manner, quantum Monte Carlo or something. Well, you cannot do transport with that. So I gave a long answer because I've thought about it for a very long time. Boris Pivak has been asking me this question since 1995. Uh, Shankar, okay? <laughs> last very quick question and the quick answer. Yeah, yeah, my question is very quick. Everybody about please. linearity coming from non analyticity and the polarization Correct. bubble. Correct. Uh, am I right that in the formula for resistivity that you showed, yes. rho naught is the largest term. Everything else is correction to rho naught. Uh, say it again, please. I didn't that, yeah, the here is the formula. Yeah, this is the formula. The first term is one. First term is one, one. because it's just and this, and this is the largest term as far as this I understand. Is, this is for theory to work. Yeah, theoretically this should be the largest term. Yeah, okay. in terms of comparison with plotting the data and comparing with right. experiment. Is it the situation when residual resistivity is always larger than any temperature dependence? It's in some of the silicon, generally it's true. It's not like much larger, but it's larger. But in some very pure silicon MOSFET, some of old Kravchenko's data, which I'm not sure, it's, it's comparable, maybe even smaller, because he has some results where the temperature depends a factor of 10 or something like that. Right, but then how can we uh, trust this formula? In oh, this, I, I never use this formula in anything I showed you. Mm -hmm. All my work is, I, as I answered, all my work is completely numerical. I never use this formula to talk about experiment. I do okay. not believe in this sort of asymptotic expansion. Okay, so at least this problem we don't have in our theory. We have the problem of RS, and I had long discussed with Igor Allen, and he agrees that his formula cannot be applied because of this problem. We never use this formula to anything. I'm just showing it to you because I'm a theoretical physicist. Okay. okay. Let's thank again Shankar, and let's move to the next speaker.